Experiences are what people love the most about travel. Viator is a website and app where you can book travel experiences like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania or enjoying the views while cruising on a catamaran in the Caribbean. They offer everything from simple tours to extreme adventures. With over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, there's something for everyone. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. When you book a travel experience with Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10, that's V-I-A-T-O-R-10, for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again and thank you for joining us. This is the Space Nuts podcast, episode 261. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and joining me as always is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing today? I am quite well and I'm very excited. I have news. I have some really fabulous news. Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, Space Nuts is going to be syndicated on the Community Radio Network Australia-wide. Uh, oh, possibly as soon as August, but most likely September, we will be doing a, um, a shorter version of the program, but it will be um, basically uh, available to over 400 radio stations around Australia. So I'm really excited about that. You become more famous. I become <laughs> more adequate. And uh, we, yeah, we, we um, are going to be available to a whole new audience. So it's, uh, nice. it's really fabulous. And the, and the way this network system operates is we'll, we'll be given a time slot and we'll be broadcast on that time slot every week and that will be available live to the various radio stations or they can download uh, the, the recorded version of the program and put it in wherever they like. So hmm. we're really thrilled and it's just one more giant leap for Space Nuts. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you yeah, know, it's fantastic, fantastic news for us. Yeah, maybe we should. We don't, uh, lift, we don't get. Uh, maybe we don't we get paid. Li- <laughs> no, we don't. Maybe we should lift our game, Andrew. That's um, you know, put I'm, a bit of effort. I'm thinking into that. It. I'm thinking that is a necessity. Yes, uh, but uh, yeah. now can't wait. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll let great. you know that, when that's all all that's on great. board. On this week's episode, we're going to uh, be talking about an ancient star explosion that uh, is um, seemingly more powerful than any supernova we've ever seen. This is one cataclysmically massive explosion by the sound of things. And, uh, yes, it happened a long time ago, so don't panic. Uh, And uh, the story I'm most excited about this week, Fred, is uh, methane plumes that have been detected from Saturn's moon Enceladus. And the headline on the story, which I thought of before I read the headline on the story, was, could this mean life? Uh, Well, it is one of the telltale signs, but uh, could be other things as well. But we'll talk about that. And we're going to focus uh, our questions on the UK because the UK, um, uh, England specifically, uh, not having a good time of it after the uh, European Cup. Whoops, shouldn't mention that. Uh, But uh, James wants to know about some of the fundamental forces and whether or not dark energy should be added to the list. And Duncan uh, is uh, well talking about all sorts of bodies in space, but um, you know, uh, focusing on the Oort cloud and things like that. So we'll uh, answer those questions a little later on. But uh, first of all, Fred, let's talk about this uh, this mega explosion that uh, has made the news, and it sounds like it happened a long time ago, but it was one of the um, probably you know, bigger than a supernova. That's that's a mighty big bang. 
And was it the Big Bang? No. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't the Big Bang. What do you call a, a super supernova? I mean, a super duper nova? That'd be a good name. <laughs> but um, they, these That's much sci- too exciting for astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, they're calling it a hypernova, uh, which um, oh, is... That's, I like that. Yeah, I like that too. I like that hypernova. Um, maybe 10 times more powerful than a supernova. Remember, supernova, uh, there, there are several different types of them, actually, but they usually accompany the end of a star uh, because what happens is um, the star is blasted to pieces. The nucleus itself often collapses, and depending on the mass, it can collapse into a neutron star or or maybe a black hole. Uh, mm-hmm. However, um, there are chemical elements that we see in the universe that uh, have been thought to have... Um, the, 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 their, their origin has not been certain, let me put it that way. So remember the universe kicked off with just hydrogen and helium and actually tiny uh, traces of a handful of other light elements as well. That They were created in the Big Bang. And then the hydrogen collected together, formed stars. The stars uh, are basically are nuclear furnaces. Uh, their high-temperature interiors uh, forged new elements inside. So you get things like oxygen and carbon and um, stuff like that. And Actually, helium is also formed, even though there was helium in the original cloud of gas. So um, what what we see is stars producing elements. And then um, there are certain elements that can't actually be produced inside normal stars, and they include things like lead and gold, the heavier elements. And they are, are have to have much higher temperatures and much more extreme processes to form them. Uh, And in particular, gold has been a bit of a puzzle. And um, in the recent years, when we've seen evidence of uh, neutron stars colliding because we can see their gravitational wave signature, uh, that is one possibility for the formation of gold. But there is another one, uh, and that is... Uh, one of these hypernovae, something that is even more powerful uh, than a supernova, presumably because it comes about with a its its progenitor star, the star that is essentially turning into a hypernova, is more massive than uh, the 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 early ones, maybe twenty five times the mass of the sun, right? Compared with a, a supernova, which would probably be smaller than that. So that's the backstory, Andrew. Um, so yeah. people have gone off looking for evidence of uh not just gold but gold in in unusual proportions with other other elements one of them is zinc in fact uh so what they've found now is evidence of that having happened in the early universe so it's not a question here of astronomers seeing the explosion the hypernova itself has not been seen that went okay bang a long long time ago um Clearly, its light has taken a long. T- it might have taken a long time to get here, um, but but it hasn't been seen. But what has been seen is a nearby star. It's well nearby. It's seven and a half thousand, if I remember rightly, light years away, uh, which has unusual chemical properties, and it's because of those properties that astronomers have figured out that the only way it can get that particular mix of chemicals is by having been formed from the debris of a hypernova. So this star is not the one that, you know, has has done the the deed, but it's it's carrying a message, if you like, from ancient Mm. times that back in those days, and it might be 13 billion years ago, there was a nearby explosion that seeded the the gas cloud from which this star formed uh, with these heavier elements. So what's sorry? Go, go on. No, no. Oh, I was just what surprises me is how we can piece this together with such uh, scattered evidence. Like you, we know this explosion happened. We didn't see it. Was there's no record of it except for the telltale evidence that exists in other forms. It's uh, yeah, it's quite extraordinary. It's it's almost like um, you have to be a detective. Oh yeah, yeah. It's very forensic. 
<laughs> um, in mm. fact, uh, you know, astronomers are, that's the way they work. It's just piecing together these little clues um, and trying to find the body. Uh, and in this case, the body is presumably the remnant of the hypernova. Um, so the story starts with a telescope very close to where I used to work at Siding Spring Observatory in northwestern New South Wales. It's, um, it's run by the ANU. It is called Sky Mapper. Uh, and it does what what you you know what the what the uh, t- name tells you it maps the sky uh it's it's a survey telescope so it forms images of the sky but it does it with a lot of different color filters and those color filters are specially chosen so they they'll show up unusual things and one of the things they show up is a deficiency of iron in the star and a deficiency of iron is telltale a telltale signature of a really ancient star. So even though this star is nearby, it's in our own galaxy, it's very, very old. Um, I mentioned 13 billion years old a minute ago, um, and it is that's about the figure that these uh, scientists who, have, who are doing this work, who are predominantly Australian, I'm delighted to say, uh, that's the figure they put on it. Uh, I've got to tell you the name of the star, Andrew, just... Because oh, it's, yes. <laughs> it's SMSS, SMSS J200322254 minus 114203.3. <laughs> and I actually <laughs> I missed out a decimal point there before the 0.54. Um, oh. th- that, that name, it's a bit of a cheat, really, because the name is. It's not a name. It's actually its position in the sky. Those are its coordinates, uh, you know, on the celestial sphere, the heavens as we look at it, uh, at them. Yep. Uh, and this has got, uh, well, the details of that is that it's, uh, I said it was deficient in iron. Um, the Basically, the something they call the iron to hydrogen ratio, it's a, the amount of iron in it is about 3,000 times less than the sun. And that you know, pushes its origins back to the very earliest history of the universe when iron was a very rare commodity. It hadn't been formed mm-hmm. by many stars. So it's got this low level of iron, but it's got these other things as well, high, very high levels of the heavier elements uh, like zinc, uranium, europium, and possibly gold. That's not been... I think that's not been firmly detected yet. Uh, and this, but the, this, these measurements come from follow-up observations that have been made with the telescopes of the European Southern Observatory, the VLT, the very large telescope down there in Chile, which we in Australia have this strategic agreement with, or strategic partnership with, until 2027. So Australian astronomers not only detected this, but followed it up with actually uh, one of the telescopes at Siding Spring, the 2.3-metre telescope, uh, which is uh, also not very far from where I used to work. My office was in the Anglo-Australian telescope, which is about 300 metres away, probably from the 2.3-metre. And uh, they also followed it up with a very large telescope, as I mentioned. So that's the story. What they've got is the first evidence uh, that such a thing as a hypernova might actually have happened, because they've been predicted they've been thought about but nobody's found the the firm evidence that they existed until now and so uh, yeah. this looks like a big you know a big step forward in the in the research of the way stars form and the way stars die as well mm. so it stands to reason that this probably wasn't the only one in yeah. the history of the universe but this is the first time we've found evidence of such a thing happening yep. because of you know the, the basic fallout of it. Uh, is it something that's going to remain in the past in terms of uh, the universe or could there be future hypernovas? Uh, they're, they're all in the past um, because we don't think stars of that mass form now. But, of course, the fact that it's in the past doesn't, hide it from astronomers because, excuse me, we've got this um, facility to look back in time uh, by looking at very distant objects. So there's a really good chance that we might detect one of these things. And it is thought that they are the source of certain types of gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts have been measured for 20, 30 years now, flashes Mm -hmm. of gamma radiation. Uh, And one possible source of them is a hypernova. And it may well be that when people look at the 
the the details of these flashes in particular you know what shape they have when you spread them out in time uh like is there a big bump at the beginning and something smaller at the end or something like that that those are the details that people will be, will be looking at in future gamma in sorry excuse me future observations of gamma ray bursts that might betray the presence of a hypernova or the, the formation Excellent. of a hypernova yeah mm. Mm. Well, that will be rather exciting if we can pick up yeah. on that. So that's tying up the loose uh, end from another another angle. Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, it's a good thing that the uh, the the products of these hypernovas aren't nearby. It'll ruin our economy. All oh, it would. Gold yeah, and but... zinc. And... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, that's yes. right. The, the reason these things remain valuable on Earth is because of their rarity. If we could have yeah. access to unlimited quantities of this stuff, we'd be in real strife. Plastic might become very, very valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk to me about plastic. Mm. <laughs> no. no. Uh, although I did read today in the news, Fred, that uh, middle of next year, the Australian government is going to outlaw soft plastics. That includes mm. styrofoam used in packing and mm. uh, all the soft plastic bags and uh, all, all of that junk is going to be a goner by the middle of next year, which is uh, really good news. It makes, uh, yeah, out of all the plastics, we can only recycle about a quarter of it. The rest yeah. goes into landfill, which is, um, yes, a uh, very unfortunate side effect of our uh, ingenuity as human beings, I suppose. Hmm. You are listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here, Fred Watson there. Experiences are what people love the most about travel. Viator is a website and app where you can book travel experiences like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania or enjoying the views while cruising on a catamaran in the Caribbean. They offer everything from simple tours to extreme adventures. With over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, there's something for everyone. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. When you book a travel experience with Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10. That's V-I-A-T-O-R-10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. Okay, we checked all four systems and in with a go. Space Nuts. Thank you for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast and thank you to our patrons who are many in number who put in a couple of bucks a week or a month actually to uh, to keep us afloat on the good ship Space Nuts. It's um, made of wood and it's got a lot of holes in it <laughs> and patrons plug those holes for us so we greatly appreciate it. And if you would like to financially support Space Nuts, it's purely voluntary, it's totally up to you. Uh, we are looking at uh, future benefits for patrons, so we'll keep uh, you informed of that, but we're looking at better ways for you to um, get you know, a bit more bang for your buck. But if you would like to become a patron, certainly visit our website and click on the Support Space Nuts uh, button, the supporter button. Uh, spacenutspodcast.com is where you'll find us, spacenutspodcast.com. Okay, Fred, let's move on to our next story. This is the one that's got me super-duper excited uh, there have been uh, methane plumes detected on Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons. This is uh, this is an ice giant, isn't it? An ice moon, I should say, um, with uh, what's believed to be uh, uh, oceans underneath. Is is that correct? It is correct. Yeah, and the evidence of that. Well, there's many pieces of evidence for. Uh, this structure of a, a rocky body with a global ocean over the top of it and an, I and an ice coating over the top of that. Uh, there, there is good evidence from different sources, but in the case of Enceladus, um, it's really direct because, of course, the Cassini spacecraft, uh, very early on in the Cassini mission, detected these plumes of ice crystals uh, spurting out of uh, cracks in the ice near Enceladus' south pole. It's really spectacular. Mm. Um, stuff and I think it still sends tingles down our spines just that the fact that we've got these geysers of ice spurting uh, out of a body at the other end of the solar system quite remarkable did, stuff. Did, did Cassini actually fly through one of those geysers? Uh, so, so I think yes several times there were several yeah. fly throughs because once they were discovered which was quite early in the mission the mission scientists you know made sure they had several orbits that took it 
I think within 50 kilometers of the surface of Enceladus at some time. Wow. It's, uh, uh, and to, to go through the plumes. And so uh, it, it was possible for the um, you know the mass spectrometer equipment on board the spacecraft to to sample these things directly, not just to look at the spectrum of the light coming from these ice plumes, but actually fly through and collect bits of ice effectively, yeah. uh, which is what they did. Um, <clears throat> of course, you've got to be careful when you do that. Um, I think they they were only really getting to the the, the, the core of these ice plumes quite late in the mission because you don't want to risk something big flying past the spacecraft or you know hitting it if if there was a um, larger chunk uh, but no it uh, it it was it's from cassini that we know so much about these ice plumes now um i remember when the uh, release when the results were released of the perhaps the the first really careful analysis of what was in them and it was uh, as a, You've mentioned uh, methane uh, plus uh, molecular hydrogen, sometimes called dihydrogen, and carbon dioxide. Uh, And those uh, particular molecules were identified and immediately the conclusion was drawn that they are possibly coming from hydrothermal vents in the bottom of Enceladus's ocean. Um, Mm. Now... Uh, it's not proof of hydrothermal vents, but it's very strongly indicative of that. And of course, partly because that's what you get from hydro- hydrothermal vents uh, on the bottom of Earth's oceans. Uh, and that uh, really got people excited. But what wasn't really commented on at the time was the high fraction of that, uh, you know, that set of different molecules that was actually methane. Uh, or methane, as it's sometimes pronounced, um, that was higher than expected. And so the question that was asked by the researchers uh, who've done this work, and they come from the University of Arizona and uh, a university in Paris called the Sciences et Lettres University. There you are. Science and arts, I guess. Science and literature, science and letters. Uh, So the question... Uh, asked by um, actually one of the scientists in Arizona, we wanted to know, could Earth-like microbes that eat the dihydrogen and produce methane, uh, methane explain the surprisingly large amounts of methane detected by Cassini? Mm. Uh, Now, uh, the the other comment that uh, this person has made is, Searching for such microbes known as methanogens at Enceladus's seafloor would require extremely challenging deep dive missions that are not in sight for several decades. Well, I can understand that. I think that's a long way down the track. So what they did was um, they took the better the better way forward. They built mathematical models to uh, look for different probabilities. Uh, associated with the different processes, including biological pr- processes that might, you know, that might fit the data. It's very a very common way. It's the, exactly this detective work that we were just talking about. You build a model that gives, it lets you test different hypotheses and gives each one a, a probability uh, as to whether it could be uh, the case. <clears throat> so, um, the the thing that they were checking is that on earth um the hydrothermal activity which you, you remember is what happens because you've got cracks on the ocean floor and seawater sinks in uh gets circulated through the rocks underneath which are hot and then kind of spews up again because it's close to a magma chamber or something like that under the surface and then comes out into the water again through the hydrothermal vents. Now, methane is actually produced by that itself uh, on Earth. Uh, The the process itself produces methane, but actually at a quite low rate. And most of the methane we see is from the microorganisms, from the from the you know the, the microbes themselves, and so uh, that's the sort of thinking that went into this modelling of the scientists of the of the uh, of the Cassini data of the of the um, you know the contents of the ice plumes, uh, and what they found was 
uh, quite interesting because um, if you if you assume there's no biology there, you don't get enough methane in your models. Uh, but if you throw in microbes into the models, then you do get enough methane. I understand so, what you're saying. Yeah. So what they say, so there's a comment here, a direct quote, which I'll read because it's always nice to do that from one of the researchers. Obviously, we are not concu- concluding that life exists in Enceladus's ocean. Rather, we wanted to understand how likely it would be that Enceladus's hydrothermal vents could be habitable to Earth-like micro- microorganisms. And the answer is very likely, the Cassini data tell us, according to our models. And biological methanogenesis, that's the formation of methane, appears to be compatible with the data. In other words, we can't discard the life hypothesis as highly, highly improbable. To reject the life hypothesis, to reject the life hypothesis, we need more data from future missions. So what it means, Andrew, is that this is still an open question. They haven't ruled it out. Yeah. That maybe the methane is speaking of microbial life on the ocean in the oceans of Enceladus. What an exciting result. That would be incredible. But okay. as you and I have discussed many times, there is likely to be microbial life in the universe and we yep. just have to find it and the evidence is stacking up this is starting to look more and more probable uh when you try and, and it comes down to a mathematical um balance that the, the, yeah. the methane that's coming out of those vents is not sufficient to answer the question as to how it was formed something else is contributing and life is one of those possibilities. Unless, of course, there's another way of producing methane that we haven't thought of that exists inside Enceladus. Well, but that's right. Mm, that is right. That's could, it. Be exactly the... could be cows. Could be cows. <laughs> yeah. It could also be sea something, cows. You know, some sort of chemical, <laughs> some sort of chemistry. Aren't they dugons? Isn't that right? Dugons. <laughs> dugons. Sea cows. So that's probably what they've got on Enceladus. <laughs> uh, the there might be some kind of chemistry that we just don't see happening, or geochemistry, perhaps it is that we don't see happening on Earth. So yeah. Mm. So it's not proof, yes. but it's really interesting. But, well, the evidence is starting to really lend itself towards possibility if not probability but yeah we until we are in a position to technologically get there get down get in and get dirty with Enceladus we we're only going to be able to do what they did which is exciting in itself but uh we're going to have to get down under there and and that will be a technological challenge I mean this is a really big thick ice field and deep oceans and, uh, yeah, it, it sounds like an amazing place. It's not the only um, ice moon in our solar system, though, is it? Europa is another possibility, isn't it? Yeah, Europa also has um, ice plumes, in fact, but mm. the that structure seems to be pretty commonplace. All, uh, th- sorry, three of the four uh, big moons of Jupiter are thought to have that model. Titan has it on, around Saturn. Possibly um, Triton, which is one of um, Neptune's moons, and uh, possibly even Pluto, Andrew. Uh, that might have the same structure as well. There is suggestion there might be an, an ocean, and that's amazing given how you know Pluto is so cold on its surface, minus 237 or something like that Celsius. Yeah. Yeah, it, it may be one day we discover that there's life on all of these or Maybe. in all of these. Maybe. Who knows? Wouldn't that be extraordinary? But, uh, yeah, let's just do it one at a time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Enceladus first, the universe next. <laughs> you know, we're simple-minded folk. We can only do them one at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't walk and chew at the same time. So, yes, let's just yeah, yeah. stick to one task. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is exciting news and let's hope that it is going to be found that that is evidence of uh, some form of life inside the ice moon Enceladus. This is the Space Nuts podcast with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. And hello to all our social media followers, uh, to our YouTube uh, viewers. Thank you for uh, following us on that platform, uh, the Space Nuts podcast group. Uh, on Facebook, uh, where you can all get together and talk to each other and ask each other questions about whatever interests you in astronomy. There's a there's a really strong group of uh, of people who 
are always talking to each other about their telescopes. Uh, and there are people who just uh, throw questions in there uh, at random for everybody to dis- uh, discuss. And sometimes there are dozens and dozens of, uh, of, of opinions about uh, this, that or the other. It's a really good group. And if you uh, love astronomy and you would like to join the Space Nuts podcast group, uh, go ahead and do so because uh, I think you'll enjoy yourself. It's a lot of fun. Now, it's not the official Facebook page for Space Nuts. There's a different page for that. But this is this is the one that's been created by Space Nuts listeners so that you can all talk to each other. So I think it's great that there's a little community there uh, dedicated to Space Nuts listeners. So um, check it out. It's the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook. Of course, you can also uh, follow the Space Nuts Facebook page while you're there. Uh, and we're on just about every other social media platform that exists in the universe as well. So check it out. Now, we've got some questions, Fred, questions from uh, the audience. This uh, first one is James. Hello, Fred and Andrew. This is uh, James Davis, originally of the Wirral in the northwest of England and uh, currently living in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. I have a question for you about the uh, fundamental forces uh, being gravity, electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces. Um, why do we not add uh, a fifth force to that? Um, I was thinking that dark energy uh, should be possibly regarded as a, as a fifth force. Uh, you know, possibly you could add to that with, uh, with uh, dark matter. Um, I, I also heard that uh, some people think that uh, gravity is not really a fundamental force. Um, because it's an illusion created by the warping of space-time. So perhaps you could uh, clarify this for me. Um, thanks very much for listening to my question. I really love your show. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, James. Thanks for the question. That's uh, that's a deep thought question, that one, Fred. And, it's a uh, great one, yeah. To, yep. to question whether or not gravity should be one of the fundamental forces. <clears throat> uh, very, very bold, James. But, um <laughs> Uh, maybe we could start by sort of reminding people what the fundamental forces are, all 5,000 of them. We've got time. We do. <laughs> There's only four, actually. Um, yeah. Oh, that's so, a relief. <laughs> yeah, it's a relief, yeah. But uh, it's a bit weird. So, okay, uh, gravity is one of them. Uh, it, uh, sorry, I'm just watching a bird dismantle the windscreen wiper on my car, which is oh, it'd be a peewee <laughs> or a crow. <laughs> I think it's a miner. Oh, Could, yeah. No, 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 it's a butcher bird. It's a butcher bird. The problem is it'll eat it. Oh, it's gone now. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, my, my car's parked outside the window. <laughs> right. What was the question again? No. Four fundamental forces, mm-hmm. um, which are generally assumed and have been for, I guess, a number of decades. Gravity... Uh, electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces. And they are pretty well understood uh, in terms of the, the, you know, the, the particulate nature of them. They're, they're, the, the forces are, are both uh, forces and particles. These ones are anyway. They're carried by force-carrying particles called bosons. Uh, and w- w- the one that doesn't have any kind of theoretical backing uh, to date is gravity. Uh, mm. it, so it's the it's the one mystery. Um, there's there's a slight quirk to them though because we know a four. We do know a four bosons that carry force, but it turns out that the weak force has two. Uh, so the electromagnetic force is carried by the photon. Uh, the uh, the strong force is carried by the gluon. And the weak force is carried by the W and Z bosons. I hope I'm remembering this properly. <laughs> so, uh, so there are four particles, but only three fundamental forces that have particle equivalents. Because um, the thinking is that there must be something called a graviton that carries gravity, but we haven't yet either detected it or built a theoretical framework that allows it to, to exist. And James is right. Um, we we think in the world of relativity as, as, as gravity of being a distortion of space. Uh, and that 
begs the question, does it need its own fundamental particle? Um, people far cleverer than me seem to think it does. Uh, so I think there's still evidence for it. I think there's still a, you know, a, a strong uh, body of evidence that, yes, gravity should still be regarded as one of the four fundamental forces. But the idea of adding to it is one that is a hot topic in uh, in, in you know fundamental physics, particle physics, and and uh, in fact astrophysics as well, because uh, for some time, and and James mentions dark energy, when dark energy was first established as being real by the fact that the universe's expansion is accelerating, that was that 1998 discovery made by the two groups, one here in Australia, one in in the United States. Um, so the ac accelerated expansion of the universe is what leads us to believe that there is this property of the universe called dark energy, something that pushes space apart. And one of the first suggestions was, is this a fifth fundamental force? And in fact, it was given a name, which was quintessence. Uh, quint quintessence is a word that comes from, uh, I think, ancient Greek ideas, actually, as, as being something fundamental. But it fits this perfectly because the, you know, the quintessence is the fifth thing um, and so quintessence was highlighted as a possibility and it, enough work was done on quintessence to recognize that it would be it should be something that would evolve with the universe that it would change as the universe uh, evolved and it appears that dark energy doesn't uh, mm. which puts it more into a different box, not quintessence, but something we call the cosmological constant, which was an idea that Einstein proposed uh, actually back in the 20s. Uh, and that is that there is a property of the universe that is proportional to space itself. In other words, there's a something in the universe, a force that gets bigger, the space gets bigger because it's a property of space itself. And that's something different from quintessence. It, it, it becomes um, not something that needs a, a, a particle to carry it. I'm not explaining this very well, and it's probably because I don't really know the details. I'm not familiar with the details of, of all this from the point of view of a, of a, a particle physicist, which mm -hmm. I'm not. So, uh, but, but that is the state of play at the moment. Um, uh, um, dark energy is thought to be something different from the fundamental forces, if I can put it that way. Okay. Dark matter was something that James mentioned as well. Dark yep. matter is has properties that tell you it is some kind of – it's made of the fundamental particles that we see already. It's not a force. It's a, it's a, um, a lepton. It's something that is, is – you know, a, a part, um, a matter particle rather than a force particle. It's a thing. It's a thing, yes, that's right, rather than a force. Um, mm. And we will presumably find it eventually, but we haven't done yet. Sorry, that was a long answer to a short question, but a really good question. Thank you very much, James. It wasn't actually a short question, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Shortish question. Then. All but, right. Uh, you know, it, uh, <laughs> So the bottom line for James is, no, we've still only got the four fundamental forces. So far. At this stage. Yes. Right. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, James. Uh, good to talk to you or good to hear from you and uh, thanks for sending in the question. Uh, the next question comes from Duncan. Hello, Duncan from Weymouth in the UK here again with another question um, about the Oort cloud. Just looking at the distance between stars, on average I read that it's about four light years and that the Oort cloud is thought to extend for two light years or at least our sun's influence over it. I was just wondering if that's the case, would it be that there is more of a general galactic morass of small bodies, rocks and small planetoids and things that we move through, some of which get attracted in by the sun or indeed other stars, some get perturbed and thrown out, but that they could be just generally a galactic body rather than specifically related to the sun. And we just move through it and pull some in, leave some behind, kick some out into other stars and other stars do likewise. And therefore, whilst there is a group of bodies out there, they're not all by any way specifically related to the sun and that they're just 
something that we travel through leaving a almost like a wake behind us of small disturbed rocks like a boat plowing through the water just a thought i don't know what you think on that anyway there you are keep up the good work bye then <laughs> Okay. Uh, thanks, Duncan. Uh, gee, where do, where do you want to start, Fred? <laughs> well, yeah. So it's it's a great question. Um, uh, the Oort cloud is postulated specifically to explain comets, uh, which are, you know, they're solid bodies, they're icy bodies, but they're, as we've discussed before, they're more like a snowdrift than an iceberg. They're they're fairly loosely bound and they they're very very dusty. Um, and the reason why Jan Oort back in the 1950s proposed the idea of this cloud, a sort of reservoir cloud, was because of what we observe in the distribution of long period comets. Long period comets are ones that come directly from the Oort cloud. They come from way out, and exactly as as Duncan says, it's a couple of light years away, the, the, the Oort cloud, something like that, maybe not quite that far, but of that order. Um, it's... Uh, so the, the observation is that these things come from all directions. They don't just come from one particular direction, which is what you would expect if it was the, uh, the sun's gravity sweeping up stuff as it progressed through a galaxy which is littered with these these bits and pieces. Mm. Um, as far as we know, the galaxy isn't particularly littered with them. We, we see um, evidence of uh, interstellar asteroids. We've seen both uh, Oumuamua, your favourite asteroid, uh, and the interstellar comet Borisov, which both of which are known to have come from outside the solar system. But the Oort cloud, uh, it, it, it's it, it, partly because stuff comes from it in all directions. So we, it, they'd, they'd have a preferential direction if it was due, due to the Earth's motion through the galaxy. Uh, but the, the other point is that... Um, stuff that is being swept up by the Earth has a higher velocity than these comets do. Um, and that's what distinguishes Comet Borisov from an Oort cloud comet, from a long period, a standard long period comet. Uh, its big difference is that it's got a hyperbolic velocity. It's coming from outside the solar system. So uh, that's basically why we think the Oort cloud is real. Uh, and uh, it, it's pretty good evidence. There's, um, it will, there will come a time, I'm sure, when we can direct, when we can detect the Oort cloud directly, because even though these swarms of ice are, or icy comet nuclei are, are very cold, they still have an infrared signature. Uh, they don't shine by much reflected light because they're, they're small, they're tiny objects, and they're halfway to the nearest star. So uh, what you're looking for is an infrared signature, which maybe we will uh, see one day okay. uh, from bodies in the Oort cloud. So just sort of um, help my brain get through this, where do we think the Oort cloud is? Uh, so if you think of the solar system, uh Neptune's the furthest planet. Mm. Neptune is 30 astronomical units away. I think I'm right in saying that. The Oort cloud is probably more like 30,000 astronomical units away. It's, it's, uh, it's a long, it's much, much further either than the planets or the Kuiper belt of, you know, these icy asteroids. Uh, there, there is, there are one or two really distant, what are called extreme TNOs. A TNO is a trans-Neptunian object. The one or two of these extreme TNOs that have orbits that make you think they might have, they might be directly coming from the Oort cloud, uh, because the far end of their orbit actually matches the distance to the Oort cloud. But they're quite rare because they're so faint and so distant, and they're small. You know, we're talking about tiny things here. So the, the, the reason I ask is um, because of the Voyager probes are they yeah. not that far out yet no they're not that far out yet ah okay yeah yeah wow <laughs> yeah. it's big yeah it's, it's a long way off then mm. uh you know people talk about them crossing the edge of the solar system but that's it's the edge in magnetic terms rather than the edge in planetary terms mm. uh, they haven't got to the Oort cloud yet okay well they probably will but we may never well, know about it we might not know that's right uh, 
Mm, okay. Uh, thank you, Duncan, for your question. Greatly appreciate it. Of course, uh, a reminder, if you do have questions for us, and we've received a whole batch, which is fantastic. So we'll be working our way through those. Uh, I think we've got a, about 100 text questions and I don't <laughs> think I'm exaggerating. Yeah, we've got quite a few, so we'll, we've got a bit to work with. But if you do have questions for us, go to our website and click on the AMA tab where you can send us a text question via the email interface or you can record it if you've got a device with a recorder like a mobile phone or a tablet or a, a computer bit with one of these um, plugged into it, uh, that big hulking microphone of mine, uh, you can record your question just by clicking on the record button. Don't forget to tell us who you are. We've got a couple from uh, people who haven't told us their name or where they're from, but that's okay. We'll still use them. We'll just say Joe Bloggs uh, or Joanne Bloggs perhaps. But, uh, yes, uh, send us your questions via our website. And while you're there, don't forget to visit the Space Nuts shop because it's worth visiting. There's lots of um, – little doodads there for you to peruse and maybe buy for yourself or a friend or a, a relative uh, that you hate, uh, that you love, uh, you know, anything like that. Uh, and, and the other thing you can do on our website is listen to our back catalogue. All 260 past episodes are there. So if you'd like to go back and, and listen to some past episodes, maybe run through the headlines and, and pick one that tickles your fancy, you might go, oh, oh. I want to learn about Mars. We only talk about Mars occasionally, like uh, with, what, 261 episodes, we've talked about Mars 258 <laughs> times. So, you know, Probably. you won't have any trouble finding that. But, uh, yes, uh, spacenutspodcast.com. Uh, Fred, that wraps it up for another week. Thank you so much. It's uh, good to catch up with you. Always good, Andrew, and I look forward to the next time. See you soon. Which could be in about a week or so. Maybe so. Mm. All right. Thanks, Fred. Fred uh, Watson, uh, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts. Thanks again to Hugh back in the studio who keeps it all together with super glue and uh, plastic wrap. He's going to have to find something else <laughs> by the middle of next year. Uh, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Catch you again on the next episode. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. <laughs>